to the front, uh, additional renewable energy will be more and more important. And that green light is for us to uh, move into the world of energy saving. They've been able to see almost 90% reduction in particulates, 40% uh, reduction in uh, nitrogen oxides, and 30% in other greenhouse gases. So, I mean, it's fairly significant what we can save. And I say it's all done with waste, so it, it, it's been a, a tremendous thing for us financially, and it's been a good thing for the, for the atmosphere when nobody's releasing any more. We hope to save, you know, in the ballpark of ten to twelve thousand dollars a month. Um, have really led to some very uh, reasonable operating expenses uh, for a seventy-five hundred square foot building. I would say it was probably about seventy or eighty percent geothermal. We have worked in the garage during the winter months and without any heat at all. And certainly we know that our environment could use uh, the clean, renewable energy uh, provided by these types of systems. Some of those little things which really do add up, I'm telling you. In St. Louis County, we have given the green light to our property management department. And that green light is for us to uh, move into the world of energy saving. And uh, what we are trying to do is maximize our operational energy uh, consumption and uh, to reduce related costs. And here in St. Louis County, we have many innovations that we have started. And we are probably, uh, I would say, a leader in at least the Midwest as far as uh, these kinds of conservation efforts. Um, for example, on our government services building we see six wind energy turbines and uh, Steve will talk a little bit about those turbines and when they were put in and, and what they can do. We installed the, the turbines um, in January of this year, 2008. We hope to save, you know, in the ballpark of ten to twelve thousand dollars a month in electricity. I was saying that our electricity rates, because we're a major commercial user, are four dollars and thirty-six cents a kilowatt hour. Where at home, it's about eight cents a kilowatt. So it gives you a sense of how important it is for commercial users, industrial users, to try to reduce their energy uses, in particular electricity. And these turbines. They light the hallways and the, uh, the stairwells in the uh, in this building here, government services building. So that, that saves us a lot of a lot of dollars. And we intend to use these as a pilot project and perhaps do this kind of thing in other areas of the county. And uh, another innovation that we have here in St. Louis County is what is called the green roof. And uh, of course, that is made up of uh, natural organic materials. Uh, here in St. Louis County, we have just installed the first half of a roof on our motor pool garage. And uh, again, Steve will tell you a little bit about that. Uh, it's an exciting project. Yeah. We've uh, one of the, the things that we've learned from uh, people around the country and around the world is these green roofs uh, do a number of, of great things. One. A normal roof there would last 10 to 15 years. This roof should last about 60 years. It costs a little bit more to install, although we were able to recoup the additional costs from grants um, and um, rebates you know, from both power company and some foundations. But um, the green roof both makes it, the building easier to heat, uh, saves us heating costs, saves us cooling costs, and it retains a lot of water. And as we know in Duluth, we're trying to figure out ways to keep rainwater from flowing into our sewage system and then into the St. Louis River and into Lake Superior. So this is, is a really tangible way to reduce that kind of water that flows uh, into that system. Um, the green roof hopefully will have that done now by the end of this year. And uh, and again, you know, we'll be measuring you know the impact and, and the savings that we will see along the way. And as everyone knows in Duluth, the flat roof is a very hard roof to maintain and uh, they can easily make leaks. 
and so uh, this roof has little or no maintenance. Also doing simple things like encouraging people to take the stairs. Um, elevators use a lot of electricity um, and we didn't realize, none of us realized until we kind of do the research on it, but uh, going downstairs uses seven calories, going upstairs, up a flight of stairs uses ten. So uh, both per personal incentives plus significant savings you know, by not using the elevators. You know, we are looking at some of the big and exciting things like the green roof and the turbines, but uh, in our county we are going all the way down to some of the smaller things like bicycle racks in front of the courthouse and even some of our equipment. We have a sweeper that sweeps the floor of our motor pool and sweeps outside and that used to be run by propane and now we have converted that to a, a battery operation saving money and of course saving fuel. I think you know we saw over in the motor pool a hybrid. We've acquired a couple of hybrid vehicles. They've been very popular with county employees. Um, so we're we're both you know saving fuel, uh, reducing our carbon input, uh, footprint, uh, reducing pollution you know that we put in into the environment, and you know the other important thing too is reducing maintenance costs uh, with all of these different. Um, or many of them, what we're seeing is we're able to both reduce the cost of paying for the electricity, but also to reduce the maintenance. I mean, the roof is probably a perfect example of that. Um, but, you know, there's others throughout the county. You saw the, the waterless urinals in our bathroom, you know, would be another example of that. So, our property management department has just done a great job in both, I think, showing the way, as Bill has said, you know, to cities, counties, and, and the private sector. Um, and also saving the taxpayers, you know, considerable money, um, which, you know, is a wonderful thing as well. Right. Most of our buildings have had energy audits now, and every time that we go for a request for a proposal for a new uh, building or renovation to be made, we put in the specifications that we want to see energy conservation and sustainability of, a, of resources in those buildings. In fact, in this courthouse here, we are saving about fifty thousand dollars a year because of improvements we've we've made in our heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, and along with high efficiency lighting, we are saving thousands of dollars for the taxpayers in that area. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, our our utility bills, you know, which would be water, sewer, electric, gas, steam, heat, and so on, almost four million dollars a year. So. That's, that's a lot of money, and as Bill said, if we can cut off, if we can shave off 10, 20% actually is our goal in reducing uh, our utility by 2010, our 10-year goal, and we're well along the way to, to succeed on that. with the Duluth Transit Authority and we're here to talk a little bit about our newer hybrid buses that we put into operation last year in 2007. DTA really has a long history of alternative fuels. After all, we started with mules, migrated to horses, moved up to electric trolleys, propane. Uh, we had both electric rail trolley and electric rubber wheel trolley, uh, gas and now diesel uh, are our mainstays. But last year, we brought in two new hybrid buses to test along with our, the rest of our system and to see how much better they would operate in terms of fuel efficiency as well as reducing uh, many pollutants into the atmosphere. First off, uh, the, the hybrids that we have are basically what we would call more of a dual engine type of uh, vehicle. We have an electric motor in them and we have a diesel motor in them and both of them operate. It's not that one powers the other, like in some uh, types of hybrids. The electric motor basically works in the bus at the slower speeds, from maybe zero up to about 12 miles an hour. And after that, then the diesel bus engine uh, kicks in and we operate on diesel. What we've found is that when the buses are operating in this fashion, uh, first off, mainly like in a downtown area, the buses are real quiet because they seldom get over that 12 miles an hour and 
people notice that right away. The shifting is not the same because you have an electric motor with a direct drive rather than the standard types of transmissions we have in the other buses. So people kind of notice a quieter and smoother ride, especially in the downtown areas. And there's many other parts of town too where we seldom get over that 12 miles an hour just because of traffic conditions as well as ridership. Along our west main line, oftentimes uh, we're operating at those speeds just because we have so many people boarding and deboarding almost every block. What we've seen in, in looking at these two is that we are having a definite increase in our fuel uh, usage, so almost 22% better uh, than a regular uh, diesel bus. Part of that uh, is obviously the hybrid, and what it allows us to do is actually have a smaller diesel engine in the hybrid bus than we do in a regular diesel bus. So that engine in itself is a little bit more efficient than our regular uh, larger engines in the bigger in the same size bus. So that's about 22% there. That equates out to virtually 25 cents a mile savings just on fuel alone with these vehicles. So that, that uh, is something that is real significant in this day of $4 plus uh, diesel costs. The other thing where we've seen uh, some savings in, from our perspective already in just you know this about eight months we've had them on the street is our brake wear is significantly less. Uh, we use uh, regenerative braking in these hybrids and what that means basically is as we take our foot off the accelerator we're actually starting to charge the batteries that drive that uh, electric engine. So like even when we're coming down a hill in contrast to buses where we are hitting the brake all the time, what we're doing is we're coming down the hill is actually having to accelerate because the regenerative braking is such that it actually slows the bus down to a, almost like four to eight miles an hour coming down a steep hill without touching the brake. So that's kind of a different situation. The other thing we've really noticed too is there's less wear and tear on transmission parts. And so we anticipate that over time we're going to see some chain, uh, some cost savings there too. In a, in a regular standard bus, engines get rebuilt, uh, transmissions get rebuilt. It may be with the hybrids, neither of those two things will have to happen, and that would be a significant cost savings. In Duluth, we're really one of those towns that's really good for a hybrid type technology because of our hills and because of the compactness of the city. We operate a lot of the system at the slower speeds and going up and down hills. And even we've been able to see on the high red, so when we operate them on our, what we might want to call our hillside routes or any of the bus ones that go up and down the hills, we save more fuel than, we, than when we're on the flats or running uh, to the far west and out to the far east, back and forth, those types of things. It's difference between four and five percent of fuel efficiency between the hillside route and running down the flats. So those are types of things that we're learning right now. The other thing uh, that is significant uh, in this day and age, obviously, is just the reduction in overall pollutants that a, that a bus engine uh, gives off. What we see here is we can, you know, just looking at the bus as it operates, you can see that there's less particulate matter. But in areas where they've tested these heavily, they've been able to see almost 90% reduction in particulates, 40% uh, reduction in uh, nitrogen oxides and 30% in other greenhouse gases. So I mean it's fairly significant what we can save. And again, uh, in Duluth I think our, our findings would be right along with that if not even better because again we're operating at slower speeds so we're using that electric motor quite a bit more than, uh, than some systems do. I'm sure many people have traveled over the Bong Bridge and perhaps seen our facility, the, uh, the Hibbert Energy Center, uh, and not really known what it, what it was and what it did. So I think uh, giving you a little bit of background of the Hibbert Energy Center would be useful, uh, especially in the context of Minnesota Power needing to meet its renewable mandate of 25 percent, which the, the state legislature passed in 2007, the Renewable Energy Act. So. Um, uh, Hibbard's origins really come out of the need as Duluth continued to grow. Originally our utility was, an was a hydroelectric utility, and, uh, uh, but we realized as we got into the 30s that we were going to need a thermal facility and trying to figure out where would be the best location where you had access to coal and cooling water of the bay 
ultimately Minnesota Power selected on this facility to build the first thermal station and that was built in the 30s and then subsequent units followed so we were basically built out by by uh, by the 50s by by 1949 I believe it was dedicated and uh, we continued to generate up until the 70s when we built uh, additional units up on the range to support the expansion of the taconite industry and then this facility was idled pretty much the late uh, late 70s early 80s and then uh, when when there was uh, a lot of foresight into trying to build the paper mill here in Duluth back in 1986. The city of Duluth, Minnesota Power, and Pentair partnered to not only build, to recommission this facility to provide uh, steam, process steam, to the paper mill, but also to allow it to eventually generate again. The function primarily is to provide steam, but as part of that, they retrofitted the boilers which were designed to burn coal to burn wood waste. So we've really been burning wood waste at this facility uh, since the mid-80s as the uh, as plant came on. Uh, you know, New Page, uh, you know, the mill generates about 140 tons of, uh, of, uh, of fuel a day, and then we're out in the market buying about another 600 tons a day of biomass fuel. At this facility, we burn uh, about 700 tons a day. We have capacity to, to burn up to about uh, uh, 2,100 tons a day, but uh, due to market conditions and availability of biomass, so far the economic dispatch has really you know, precluded us from expanding that. But one of the things that we'll be doing here in the coming years is we're planning on uh, buying the assets from the city of Duluth. Uh, we have a purchase, uh, you know, redevelopment agreement with the city of Duluth that should close uh, in December of 2008, which will allow Minnesota Power to buy the boilers for 2.5 million in the associated steam district assets. And then uh, Minnesota Power over the next four years will invest into 22 million to bring this facility up to grade or up to speed so that we can generate uh, 140,000 megawatt hours of additional renewable energy. So Minnesota Power is, is committed to this facility uh, and it definitely fits within our renewable strategy which is uh, really a three-legged approach and we call it wind, water, and wood and the wood leg being the biomass and there we're looking at leveraging our existing facilities both here in Duluth and the Rapids Energy Center in Grand Rapids as well as partnering with other customer, paper mill customers, uh, to achieve our, our objective of the 25%. Sam Atkins and I owned the building in the uh, 80s and 90s and we did the original renovation starting in 1985 with our first retail store opening. But one of the problems with the multiple use building, especially retail, is that um, they need air conditioning. People don't like coming into a hot building in summer and summer is the best part of our business cycle. So we needed air conditioning and with all the water around us we tried, we thought we'd try the geothermal system. And so what we ended up doing was drilling our own well and pumping about 50,000 gallons a day through air exchangers, pulling the coolness out of the water and pumping it around the building on the first, second, and eventually third and fourth floors. And that system is still intact today to some extent it still works really well on the, the beginning and the end of summer. One of the reasons that we choose, chose the geothermal was that we had all this available water um, in the area and it's just right below um, the surface here. And so we thought by having our own well, we would be able to pump as much water as we needed um, to keep that water moving, circulating, so that we could pull as much of the cool um, coolness out of that water as possible. Back when I had the building back in the 90s, I would say it was probably about 70 or 80 percent geothermal. The lower floors that have more electrical inputs in terms of lights, display, people coming and going out through the doors. With Day Saigon with their kitchen vent pulling the air out, you know, we just needed much more replacement air. Um, 
and we just couldn't quite do it to the satisfaction of the tenants totally on geothermal. Whereas it works well on the third and fourth floor, on the first and second floors, we have added um, conventional electric air conditioning to supplement the geothermal. Um, back in the late 70s, we actually had a wind turbine on the roof. Um, my family had this building when I was a kid, and so I grew up here with the mattress business, and it was so blooming windy down here that we had this idea of uh, prying a wind generator on the top of the building. And it was actually almost too much wind um, for the area, and there was quite a bit of turbulence due to the building itself. But it was an interesting experiment, and it kind of got us thinking about alternative uses for the building um, due to our location. And we used that, we used that uh, wind turbine to power emergency lights that were all battery operated. So the wind generator filled batteries and then ran emergency lighting as needed. Bob Hammond, I'm the director of operations at the deck. We used to heat the building with uh, our own boilers. We were uh, we burned uh, natural gas, and we were on an interruptible deal with that. So when the city hit a peak on the real cold weather, they take us off, and we'd have to burn oil, and then we'd heat water with oil. We're a hot water building. We're not a steam building. We heat with hot water, and uh, then we went to the steam plant, and they heat our water for us with waste heat that used to go up the stack. So they're not really burning any more coal to heat over there. They're giving us the waste heat that used to go up their chimney and heating our water for us and, and pumping it over here. And it's in a closed loop, so it just circulates between us and the steam plant. And we're using the, the same water. They, just, uh, they send it over at about 210 degrees, and it goes back to them about five degrees colder than that. So we don't, that's how much heat we take out of it. So it's, it doesn't take a whole lot once we get it up to the 210 to keep it there. And I say it's all done with waste, so it, it, it's been a, a tremendous thing for us financially, and it's been a good thing for the, for the atmosphere when nobody's releasing any more. We've still got our big chimney here, but it's shut down. We don't use it for anything. And they've still got their big chimney over there, but there's no more coming out of it as a result of heating us. So it's, it's a wonderful deal for everyone. and I'm here in the back parking lot of the Whole Foods Co-op uh, here in lovely Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, behind me is our solar panel and this was an item that was put in when we built our building um, or I should say uh, rebuilt <laughs> or renewed or repurposed the building that was already here. Uh, we made the decision to have a solar panel um, not only to create energy but also to make a statement about what we're about and the importance of um, sustainable energy sources. Uh, it's also part of the LEED certification that we received on the building. Currently, uh, you're, I'm standing here in a nice, bright, sunny, sunny summer day, and on a day like this, this uh, unit will collect enough energy to run, approximately, um, enough energy to run all of our uh, checkouts in the front. Uh, all five of them, plus the one at customer service, so all those computer units, plus uh, for about eight hours. So um, it, it, it's a small drop in a very big bucket of energy that any grocery store uses. Some of the things that are not quite as obvious are we not only have a bike rack out in front of the store to encourage that uh, alternative transportation piece, but we also have a carpool parking spaces. We have two carpool parking spaces to encourage people from separate households to come together to the co-op. They get premier parking if they do that. Uh, we also have very close proximity to public transportation. We also have um, a, a really unique compressor system and uh, one of the things that is that helps to reduce our energy load is not having a separate compressor on every single piece of refrigeration or freezer equipment in the store. Although we do have some freestanding units that's sort of unavoidable, the vast majority of them are actually on a compressor rack and this is a high efficiency compressor rack. 
Well, besides a lot of the little tiny things that add up to a lot of big things like motion detectors, make sure that our lights turn off if there's nobody in the room and somebody forgets to turn the light switch off. Some of those little things which really do add up, I'm telling you. The other thing that we do do is purchase wind credits and that equates to about 12% of our yearly energy use. And we did receive the Energy Star rating last year for our building, which is absolutely terrific. So. Hi, I'm Chris Edwardson. I'm a member of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Duluth, and I'm going to be talking about our new building. Uh, we are a member of the Unitarian Universalist Association and have what is known as Green Sanctuary uh, status. Uh, this means that we have a commitment to the environment and to uh, teaching our, our members about the environment and how they can lessen their impact on it. When we were designing this building with our architect, uh, we, we were clear in our uh, intent to have as little impact on the environment as we could uh, during the construction and in the long-term operation of the building. So some of the features that we have incorporated into the building are underground parking, and a green roof. So some of the ad advantages of the green roof in terms of uh, heating and cooling are that they they actually reduce the load on the building. Uh, so so we felt that having a green roof would uh, was an important feature. Our uh, building is uh, burned around the parking area and the burning helps to uh, maintain a constant temperature in, in the garage. We have worked in the garage during the winter months and without any heat at all. We found it was very comfortable. Because the uh, building was able to be oriented to the south, we have put a large number of, of uh, windows on the south side and that helps in the uh, winter time for uh, solar gain. And we have an overhang which uh, eliminates the uh, overheating of the building in the summertime. The north side of our building has very few windows uh, except for the uh, sanctuary. The walls are highly insulated. We have anywhere from 8 to 12 inches of bat insulation on all, all of the walls and then a, a layer of insulation board either one to two inches in thickness was added to the exterior of the building. The one thing we haven't done on our roof and we hope to do so in the future is to put in solar panels. We have run the necessary conduit for the wiring for that. So, that, so that's a future plan. with the Renewable Energy Alliance and what we do, the primary focus of our, of our agency is to do solar space heating for low-income families. Um, solar space heating is, is significant and important because we actually, uh, we use in Minnesota over 50 percent of our resi residential energy use is actually used for space heating. We use a tremendous amount, uh, more, more than we do for electricity, more than we do for uh, uh, hot water, we use a tremendous amount of energy for space heating. So if we can help low-income families through the use of space heating, using solar, using nothing but the sun, um, it's a great way to try and impact those families long term and be able to, to uh, set free a lot of the money that they would have to spend on, uh, on an ongoing basis. Not only are we trying to assist low income families, but we're trying to assist uh, Minnesota taxpayers. In the state of Minnesota last year, uh, we spent $78 million. That's $78 million we spent last year on heating assistance. Now heating assistance is a very important uh, program in that it keeps many uh, low income Minnesotans warm during the winter, but it also doesn't represent a long term solution. The problem is, as uh, you probably are well aware, the money that we spend on paying for fuel oil, uh, natural gas, propane, those are all fossil fuels and all of that money leaves uh, definitely our state 
if and much of it leaves our country immediately to pay for those to pay for that. Um, so we, on the other hand, are trying to figure out how can we actually reduce that burden on taxpayers and simultaneously have a, an economic expansion component that allows that money to stay in the state of Minnesota. Every dollar that is that is kept in this family's pocket is much more likely to be spent right here in Duluth uh, than it would have been if it was going to pay for fossil fuel to keep them warm. Uh, perhaps you noticed that the, the panels that we put on the people's houses um, are vertical. Oftentimes people think of solar, uh, solar as being you know, up on a pole or um, you know, on the top of a roof. Um, and that is typically what you'll see with solar electric, photovoltaic. Uh, but solar space heating we, we install vertically on the side of a building specifically for the purpose that when the sun is low in the winter time uh, the, the panels heat up. It doesn't make any difference if it's 30 below out. The panels still are very efficient at gathering the heat from the sun and uh, blowing it into the house. And so uh, during the summertime, when the sun is high in the sky, it hits the panels at a very, uh, very askew and as a result they actually stagnate at a lower temperature in the summertime than they do in the wintertime. So, um, so it's, for, for multiple reasons it seems like sort of low hanging fruit and a really quick and easy way for us to impact the environment, for us to impact low income families, and for us to impact uh, the taxpayers of Minnesota and in our communities. Uh, each one of these systems produces approximately uh, anywhere between 7 and 9 million BTUs uh, annually for heating season in, in Minnesota that is. Uh, differs according to what part of the country people are in and what their solar access is. Um, but why that's significant, and maybe BTUs don't mean a whole lot to, to people, but for instance, this particular uh, house, uh, this system provided 21% of their heating load this past winter. And that's a, a tremendously significant way to impact this family. Um, how, we, how we select people's eligibility is based on uh, people that have been eligible for heating assistance and or weatherization. So we encourage people, if they're interested in our services, to get involved with their local uh, community action program, for instance in Duluth, uh, we work with AEOA to identify what families are, should, will be eligible. We don't reinvent that wheel, we actually work with the community action program because they already def define eligibility criteria and review people's uh, income, etc. Uh, they also uh, weatherize homes and we're able to work with them to identify a home like this one that's been weatherized so any heat that we do generate using solar space heating uh, they're going to get the biggest bang for the buck and that heat is, is not going to be immediately lost out of the roof of the home. The reason too that we, we've done this for low income families is that as we try and make a transition to a clean energy future in Minnesota and particularly in Duluth, um, oftentimes it's low income families that have the hardest time dealing with the capital to make a move to uh, solar electric, solar hot water, wind, uh, those things oftentimes can be capital intensive and solar space heating is the lowest hanging fruit. It's the cheapest way to install solar and thereby has the, actually the quickest payback. Uh, these systems will pay for themselves in anywhere from 9 to 12 years and of course will just be a bankroll after that. So for a number of reasons we've discovered that this is the, the quickest way to impact the greatest number of people in Minnesota and we're, we're really happy to do it. Uh, we want to continue to increase our installations in Duluth. Duluth is a city, when you think about it, it's basically most of it's on the hill facing uh, south-southeast, has great solar access, has, it's, a, it's a great opportunity and there's a lot of homes that we would love to uh, continue to install solar space heating on and a lot of families that could certainly make use of it and certainly we know that our environment could use uh, the clean renewable energy uh, provided by these types of systems. I'm Pete Grabbin, I'm the director at Hartley Nature Center, and uh, it's a $2.8 million project. Uh, it was more or less a joint project between the city of Duluth and the nonprofit Hartley Nature Center, and uh, it is the fruits of a lot of people's labor. Um, and looking at the energy uh, pieces, in terms of electricity, we have an 11.8 uh, kilowatt array up on the rooftop. Uh, it's not an ideal angle for this climate. Uh, it's a fairly good angle for, for summer uh, collection and harvest uh, and uh, not ideal for winter. So we also have a tracking unit out in our parking lot. It's a 1.3 kilowatt unit uh, which has the benefit it's dual axis. It tracks the movement of the sun both throughout the day and also seasonally makes adjustments uh, based on where the sun is on the Earth's horizon. 
So something that's much more adaptable for a northern climate like uh, would be the tracking unit like you see. In, in the wintertime, we still see close to that 1.3 kilowatt capacity uh, that um, one would hope for um, when you make an investment uh, like that. So um, kind of just saying a few more things about electricity. Our auxiliary um, heater for this facility is also electric. Uh, it's a 7,500 square foot building and our auxiliary uh, heater is about the size of a brown paper bag uh, for a building of this size. It's quite remarkable um, and uh, you know again we're doing in-floor heat and, and it's, it's, um, it gets it done. Uh, passive solar design as you can see, Clara Story, solar wall, uh, also sometimes referred to as a solar well, and the ground source heat pump and uh, all coming together backed up by an electric boiler Oh, and also an electric um, domestic hot water heater, which also is taking water from the ground source heat pump. So we're preheating the water before we even run it through a domestic hot water heater. Um, have really led to some very uh, reasonable operating expenses uh, for a 7,500 square foot building. Uh, in terms of education, uh, it's been very interesting. We have had uh, school programs. Uh, elementary school programs. It is an elementary school offering to come and do a green building uh, program. Uh, we do a couple other energy uh, offerings for kids including some summer camps, Energy Explosion and Solar Sprint where the kids make model solar powered cars and things. So really uh, kind of fun stuff for kids. But we do an awful lot of tours uh, for the area colleges um, and tours ranging anywhere from a 20 minute uh, up to a two hour uh, with some pretty high powered questions thrown our way which is good it keeps us on our toes and keeps us learning more about our system so but uh, typical year we probably do I'm guessing about two dozen uh, college tours that are, are fairly uh, um, extensive uh, in, in content so um, other things that we're doing, we've just recently gotten a couple of grants from Minnesota Power, uh, one from Minnesota Power and one from the Northeast uh, CERTS or Clean Energy Resource Teams group, where we are going to be taking a show on the road, um, knowing that the state standards uh, for 6th grade and to some extent ninth grade um, are especially energy focused, sustainability focused. Of course, the schedule that a 6th grader has or a ninth grader has doesn't allow them to come here and so really to take our show to them we'll have an energy education trailer uh, get into things like carbon footprint but working demonstrations in micro hydro uh, photovoltaic or solar panel um, wind turbine uh, even a hydrogen fuel cell uh, functioning hydrogen fuel cell so kind of a nice array uh, of educational things will hopefully get kids interested um, particularly when they get older and make life choices.